The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Klaatu, and this is uh, Lightworks cross-platform video editing. Um, all right, so uh, who am I? I'm Klaatu at member.fsf.org. If you want to uh, contact me uh, for any reason, you can email me there. Um, I'm also the site maintainer owner of lightworking.net, which is a, a very modest right now site dedicated to uh, lightwork tutorials. So after this talk is finished and you've forgotten everything that I said, uh, you can go to lightworking.net and find at least three pretty good tutorials on the subject. And then I've got a couple of magazine articles coming out in a couple of Linux magazines about lightworking. So there's going to be plenty of reading material for you after this talk. Some of it's free online. Some of it you'll have to buy at the bookstore. Uh, I'm also the maintainer of Slacker Media, uh, which is a website dedicated to doing multimedia on, that's not it, multimedia on Linux. I, I work at Pittsburgh Filmmakers Institute in real life, uh, so I do a lot of multimedia stuff, and I do it all on Linux. Um, the whole school doesn't do it all on Linux, but I personally do all my work on Linux. So this is basically a conglomeration and sort of aggregation of everything that I learned doing real multimedia stuff that's going to be shown in an in a, in art house theater, uh, you know, getting it to be ready for that on Linux. So you can check that site out. Um, I'm also the maintainer of straightedgelinux.com, which is a tutorial site that you can go to sometime. GNUWorldOrder.info, which is my podcast, and Hacker Public Radio, which is another podcast that I contribute to. So that's, that's who I am. Um, that's why you're here, sort of. Advantages to Lightworks. OK, so a couple of caveats before I start. Lightworks is, quote, being open sourced, with the emphasis on the ing. Um, Lightworks, about a year ago, a company called EditShare, which was selling Lightworks and a bunch of hardware consoles. And these hardware consoles were sort of jog dials and buttons. It was like a specialized keyboard that editors really liked using because it made them think of old film reel editing stations called, um, I just blanked on the name. Um, ah, man, I just, uh, I just blanked on the name. Anyway, it made them think of these old editing systems, flatbed editors, Stein, uh, Steenbecks. Um, so they really liked it. It was like a couple of grand. It was a very expensive solution, very sort of designed for professional. Why isn't that all showing up on the screen? Um, kind of designed more for the professional editing group. Um, so. EditShare announced, well, we're going to open source Lightworks and give the software away. You can still buy the specialized controller for like $3,000 or whatever it is. It's sort of ridiculous, but, but the software will be free. Um, so I was an alpha tester for Lightworks, and I am currently a beta tester, and you can be too. You can go to Lightworks, LWK, LWKS.com, and download a beta copy for yourself and try it out. You can post on their forums about all the bugs that you find. The thing is, it's been a year now. They've got a Windows port, which already existed. They've got a Linux port, and they've got a, they're, they're working on the Mac port, the Mac port, but I haven't actually seen any of the source code. So when they say it's open source, I don't know if that means, what they're saying is that it means that once they're ready for it to be open source, they will release the code to everyone. But just so you know, I have not seen the source code yet. There's, there's, People have talked about it, people have mentioned it, and that's, that's what they're saying, is that they're going to release it when they're ready. That's not unprecedented. It's kind of like Ubuntu's working model, if you think about it. So that Lightworks is kind of doing this isn't all that, you know, it, it's, not, it's not completely strange. I don't love it, but that's how it is right now. So just, who knows? In six months, if they betray my trust, this talk might be all for naught. Um, but right now, it's, it's supposedly going to be open sourced. And, and to their credit, I've talked to them a lot about 
uh, packaging Lightworks for Slackware, and someone is currently packaging it for Fedora, and they've been really, really helpful. So if that's any indication of, of what they really do intend, uh, I, I have a pretty good feeling that we will eventually see source code for, for Lightworks. Um, the big deal about Lightworks right now, I think, is that it's cross-platform. It's cross-platform, it's very mature, uh, it will be work it's already working on Windows and Linux, it's going to work on the Mac, so no matter what, you're going to be able to give people a, a, a no-cost editing, video editing solution. Um, hopefully it'll also be free software. Um, Another advantage to Lightworks is that it is a structured editing model for offline editing and matchback, which none of you even know what that means. But for if, if people are talking to you about video editing and how they need professional video editing, blah, 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 that's what they need. They need structured video editing. They need offline editing. Uh, they need the ability to bring their offline stuff back online. Basically, it's got to do with resolutions, downscaling your video so that you can actually edit it on a home computer and not on a Beowulf cluster of a bunch of boxes. So uh, being able and, and having it designed to, to gracefully offline and online is a very important and significant feature that um, really should make the professionals, the, the real professionals, uh, no I'm not, um, very happy. Disadvantages. Like I say, I haven't seen the source code yet, so there's that. Um, it is, some, for some people, the structured editing aspect is going to be a disadvantage. Like a lot of people will love how structured it is, and you'll see what I mean by that in a minute, but some people love that. Some people who grew up on like Final Cut where you can just drag and drop things and drop them everywhere and just not really worry about your time code and whether you're using clips that don't actually exist in the full res version, they, they, they have a very hard time sort of dealing with something that actually tracks your footage. So for some people that's a disadvantage. Um, it requires registration, which is weird. It's a free uh, download, but you still have to like register with Lightworks. I don't know if that's just during the beta phase or if that's just something be uh, that they're going to use because they're going to eventually sell additional codecs. Like, so if, you are, if you're in an Avid shop and you need an, a specialized Avid codec, you can buy additional support to plug into Lightworks and that'll all be managed through the registration. I don't know if it'll always be everyone who ever uses Lightworks has to register or not. Uh, no source code yet. And also, it's only being developed right now for Ubuntu, which, I mean, in, they're, they're being super helpful in repackaging. It's, it's not that big of a deal. I kind of have a port working on Slackware if you don't really care about it working. Oops, libcrypt uh, shared object error. Uh, I need to like recompile SSL or something like that. I don't know. I haven't looked into what that error means. That's that's like the fifth error in the process. I just kind of got burned out uh, last week on that. But but and they're they're being super helpful. Like every problem, I just I post in their beta forum and say, hey, why am I getting this error? What do I need to do? So, um, and they have said that they do intend to support more distributions as as they get closer to being finished with the 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 code the the port. So I, I have a feeling that, you know, again, like if, if they are to be believed and if they, if they follow through on what they're saying they're going to do, uh, I think it won't be that big of a deal. But right now, if you want to run it on anything but Ubuntu, um, it's, it's really kind of a hack. They, they, there is a Fedora RPM that one of the beta testers has put out, but in order to get it up and running, you have to pull in a bunch of different versions of libraries and I think maybe make a couple of sim links to, to kind of hack it onto your system. So it's not a, it's not a super graceful uh, process. Okay, that's the end of my slideshow. Um, so now we're gonna do the super awkward uh, transition from one computer to another and hope that this dual monitor thing picks it up. Or do I have to reboot? You got an NVIDIA card? If you do, you need to run NV settings manager. Oh, really? 
Okay. No, I think I'm using the Nouveau drivers, though. Nope, I'm not. Okay, cool. That'll work. Thanks. Um, right, we're good. Oh, wait, is that mirrored? Are you seeing what I'm seeing or no? I don't know what you're seeing. <laughs> no, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. All right, where am I? There you go. There we go. Uh, apply. One more time. Okay. Try that trick. And while we're waiting for me to figure dual monitor support out on Ubuntu, um, let's, I should mention that right now is a really good time, I think, for Linux video editors. Um, it's a little bit late to mention it now, but uh, yesterday there was a talk about Caden Live, which I can't recommend uh, more. In, in, I, I recommend it very, very highly, is what I'm trying to say. It's a great video editor. That's the one that I use in real life on a daily basis at work. So if, you're, if, if what you see today is, is not quite ready, and, and trust me, it, it's not, but um, it's, it's appealing. But if it's not quite what you're looking for right, right now, uh, you can check out Caden Live. You can check out OpenShot, and uh, Pity V is supposed to be really good too. So there's a lot of what's that? Pity V P I T I V I. It's a mostly Python G streamer based um, application, and it's supposed to be really good and very much, from what I understand, you know, kind of that, the old the old um, the old iMovie model. OK, cool. Now we are seeing the same thing. OK, so downloading the, um, the application itself, I mean, I don't probably have to go over that with you. It's, it's an Ubuntu package. You go to the, uh, oh, I'm still not seeing it over here. But OK, I, I can work like this. Um, it's an Ubuntu package. You go to lwks.com. You download the binary, or the, uh, the beta package, and you install it. It, uh, it comes up with this little icon here. Lightworks, you click on it, and now it's loading. Let's see if it makes me sign in or if it remembers who I am. OK, so normally here you'd see a sign-in screen, which you, uh, if you don't have a name, or if you don't have an account, rather, you would uh, click a little register button down here somewhere, and it would take you to the LWKS website, register with, with, with EditShare as a Lightworks user. And, uh, and then you sign in. Uh, for now, we don't need to do that because it remembers who I am. Um, but we still need to create a project. So um, I'm not using this, so let me get it out of the way. It's all good. Um, so a new project is simply, you know, just like any, in any other application, you're, you're making a new project file, essentially. It asks you some hard questions up front, mainly the frame rate. Um, if you don't know your frame rate, there are lots of ways to find out. The best way is to uh, open up your video file that you want to edit, or like one of the video the files that you know that you want to edit, in VLC, and find out what 
what kind of file it is. VLC will tell you all kinds of information. Uh, VLC won't be installed by default on Ubuntu, but again, you can just kind of get that from the Ubuntu Software Center. So you've got a movie file, and if you go up to, um, uh, let's see, where is it? Tools, Media Information, I think. Yeah, Tools, Media Information. Go to the Codec tab. It tells you all kinds of information. And there's, there's other programs that'll do this for you, too, but this is kind of the the GUI way to do it. You just kind of look here and it says, okay, you've got a video stream here. Uh, it's MPEG-4, it's 1280 by 720, so that's 720p, uh, and it's 23.97, which generally speaking, unless, unless your video editing application makes it really, really obvious that you can round that up to 24 frames per second. I think you can get all that out of the uh, Properties tab from the Nautilus as well. Like just right-click the file itself and go to Properties. There's a, uh yeah, okay, that's cool. I did not even know that. That's really neat. I'm a KDE man myself. I don't need Nautilus until now. Um, but yeah, so apparently you can get that in Nautilus if, if you want to. That's cool. I didn't know that. Um, that's kind of new, right? That's not, that hasn't. That's been there a while. Really? It did that back in the GNOME 2 days before Unity. Oh. Oh, funny. Um, okay, so we know it's 24 frames per second. Some video editors will give you more options, but you, it's safe to round up. And then you just give it a name. This is a convention that you'll see a lot in Lightworks. To, to create anything new, you simply give it a name, which sounds very like spiritual and godly. You name something, and it comes into being. So just kind of remember that, because you're going to do that a lot. So this is um, actually Noah's short film at school. Uh, so I just created a, a name for this project, and I'll create the project now. And now it dumps me into, well, it's cheating because I've been using it, but normally what you'd see is just this. So as you can see, this is a full screen application, and I'm sorry that the lights really aren't that dim in here, but um, this is a full screen application. You can minimize it with the little minimize button up here in the upper right corner, wherever my mouse is. Um, right here, up in the upper right corner. You can minimize it to get back to your desktop. But, but generally speaking, when you're in Lightworks, you're sort of in Lightworks. That's kind of the, the model that they have set up for you. Um, this is your toolbar over here on the left. And then you've got, you can barely see it down here on this screen, but in real life you'd be able to see a lot better. You've got another toolbar down there. You've also got a red shark. Avoid it. It's dangerous. Don't touch it. It bites. Um, so this is our workspace. And the first thing that you'd want to do when you're editing video, probably, is to get video into your workspace, right? That's the top button, logically enough. So you click the import button. Um, this is a much smaller resolution than I'm used to, so I'm, everything's sort of huge right now. But here we are in, um, in, a, in an import menu, or a window, rather. Under places, you can kind of see where this came from. It's got a My Documents, a desktop. Uh, sort of, there's no home directory. You can't like go home. So what I usually do is go to My Documents, and then go a folder up, and then navigate to my, to my, uh, to my footage. But you could just as easily go out to your file system, go to home, and then go to, uh, to wherever you've got your footage. So this is just a, 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 you know, a file manager, essentially, of all your footage that you, you might want to import. So I'll just take some sort of at random here. I'm going to take the, oops, the ones that I converted so that this presentation will go a little bit smoother. This isn't the most powerful box that I own, so. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole host of format problems right now. Um, that nasty one, Og Theora, you know, the, the one that just won't work on anything, uh, still doesn't work on Lightworks. I don't know why. I don't know if they're going to, I think they're going to make that work. I mean, but like the obvious ones that I usually default to for Linux, Xvid and Theora, just, and even WebM, like Lightworks doesn't know that they exist yet. So it's, it's kind of a pain, really. It's, it's, um, 
but it's early. It's still in beta, so give it time. Um, well, that's, that's one thing that this does support out of the box. So yeah, this is, Lightworks has, it's, it's a really weird conglomeration of like proprietary codecs that you don't think should work, and then the free ones don't work, and then like other proprietary ones also don't work and you have to pay extra for them. So I don't know, <clears throat> I haven't figured out the, the, the logic there yet, and I'm, I'm assuming that what's happening is that this is exactly what the Windows origin looked like, and then they're, as they port it to Windows, uh, to Linux and Mac, they will, once that's done, then assuming that they really open source the code, then all of us can jump in and start bringing in like the free codec support and stuff like that. That's kind of what I'm imagining. Um, and to be honest, even Avid kind of went to that model, which is unheard of. They don't do that sort of thing. They went with an, an, an available API for codec support. So this, they, Lightworks may actually do that. Okay, so this is all the, the footage that I just now imported. Um, I guess the, the, to summarize your, your question, like if you grab a video camera off of the modern day, yeah, it's going to work because they're, they're all doing AVCHD and Lightworks plays really well with that. So, yeah. Um, so this is the footage that I just imported. Now notice that up in the right, is that the right or is that the left? Left. Left corner, uh, it says imports. So how do we create, how do we save something in Lightworks? I just told you. Name it, right? Yeah, so I'm going to say that this is Noah uh, Real 4, because Noah is the guy who directed this thing, and it's Real 4, um, so that's what I'm naming it. So now this thing has just been saved, which is a really kind of weird, like in our minds, we want to go up somewhere to a menu and click on File, Save As, or whatever. You don't do that in Lightworks. You've got your project. Everything in your project exists in little windows, and as long as you name them, then they, they will persist every time you open up your project. But if I was to import something from some other place, I'll grab some, again, just kind of arbitrarily here. Now I've got this new import window. If I don't save this and I close it, those things may as well have never been imported. They don't, they don't exist, they're not available to me anymore. So um, whenever you do something that you, you like in Lightworks, you probably need to name it and, and make sure that it's going to stick around. And I think we'll probably have time, but um, I'm not gonna go into it yet, but there is a little bit about how to manage that. Like, well, okay, so if I, if I close this window, how do I get back to it? So I don't want to go into that yet because I don't want to I don't want to bog you down with information that doesn't have anything to do with video editing. I assume a lot of these files are large, so when you name it, then it has to copy everything. No, and there yeah, there's a there's a whole there's a whole thing about media management, which is a super super important uh, sort of concept if you're editing something that you want to keep around. I don't want to get into it yet, but if either. Remind me later if we're, if we're running out of stuff to talk about, or go to the site lightworking.net, and I wrote a whole article on media management in Lightworks, because it's just that important. Like, if it, yeah, because there there's differences. You can just, you can link back to the original files and edit them, or you can say, yes, take those files, copy them to this separate drive, and edit those, dri those files. So yeah, there is, there's a, that's an important distinction. In this case, we're just linking to these files. We haven't actually copied any bits or bytes. Um, okay, so we've got, we've got, I mean, this, this probably looks fairly familiar. If you've ever seen a, a modern video editor, the kind of the concept of, okay, I've got a list of all my clips in, on, in one window, so now what do I do with it? Well, traditionally, what you would do with it um, is, is you would look at the footage. You would see what it contains, because MVI underscore 9353.mov isn't very descriptive. So if you see these little, uh, you can probably tell as I roll over these little I these clips, there's little icons that appear uh, over on the right of each, of each clip. So the only one that you really probably care about initially is the second one down called Viewer. 
So if we want to view this clip, for instance, we would open that up as its own viewer. Is this going to work? Yes. And now it kind of opens up in this sort of view window. And now I can view it. Now, this is typical for clips. I mean, if you're shooting something, usually there's parts of it that you don't really want. Actually, I don't think we probably want any of that clip. That was a bad choice, apparently. All right, so which one was that? I think it was that one. I'm deleting that one, because that was obviously a bad take. So I'm going to look at a different one. OK, let's, let's say that this is a good take. So I'm going to hit the I key on my keyboard, I for in. And then I'm going to click O when I want to go out. So basically, I'm just telling Lightworks, yeah, I see all of this footage here, and it all sucks until it gets to this point, at which point, yeah, I really like this stuff. And then at some point, see, this is a fight scene. So probably when the, the guy's out of frame, I would I would want to hit O, and that would be kind of like my initial kind of rough edit of that clip. That's the good part of that clip. Now I can keep doing that to all of my clips if I'm, if I'm the kind of person who has, I know what the scene is, I, I know that I just need to kind of keep reviewing the footage and s sort of marking the good parts in all of the clips. I can do it that way. Or if I like to piece things together one step at a time, I could do it that way too. Either way, I've made, I've made a, an edit decision. I've, I've, made a, I've marked, I've marked the, the footage where, it, where it's good. And that's going to stick around uh, because it exists within my little import bin. But eventually, you're going to want to put it all together right, into a movie. That, again, pretty logically, is the second button down over here on your toolbar, these little multi-track lines. Click that, and that creates what you and I would probably call a timeline if you've, if you've done any kind of reading or, or any lessons on, on any modern video editor. We'd call it a timeline. Lightworks calls it an edit. So this is our edit window. And if we know that we like this clip, Usually, I don't work on such a small screen. I apologize. It's starting to get kind of crowded, but I can shrink things down. So if I like this clip, I want it in my, in my movie for sure. Then as long as it's an open window, geez, as long as it's an open window, all I have to do, where did my edit go? That's my reel. OK, as long as I have this window open, I know I want it in my movie. That's where these buttons at the very, very bottom come into play. You've got two really important ones. One is replace, and one is insert. Right now, neither of them really matter all that much because there's nothing in my, in my edit. So I could, I could do either one. It doesn't really matter. But to get that clip down into my, into my actual movie that I'm going to keep, I would, in this case, I'll just do an insert. And you can see that it drops it down here into my little edit window. And so now I can close the viewer. And now this is my edit of my movie so far, which consists of one clip, which I can play by hitting the space bar. And we can see it playing back right there in that, in that window. OK, so it's, it's a one-clip movie right now. So in order to save this edit and make sure that it never goes away, of course, I'm going to say uh, Noah edit. And now this edit exists as part of the persistent data in my project, in my, in my uh, project file. So there's no, I, I'm never going to save anything that I'm doing here in Lightworks. I mean, if I leave right now, um, if I close Lightworks, and then I open it back up. There's my project that I've, that I've been working on. And everything is restored exactly as I left it. I mean, right down to the window positions.
including, like I said, all of my uh, little uh, import, the imported clips, the one clip that I have in my edit. So you don't ever, you'll never go to a file menu and save in Lightworks. It's, it's always just the fact that you are working in a project and the fact that you are naming windows as you work, that's saving everything as persistent data. That's the most, it's, it's kind of like one of the more confusing things. Like when I first started using it, I'd, I'd construct a test edit and then I would, I would close Lightworks and I'd reopen it and the edit would be gone. It would just be, there would be no edit there or I would just close the window and there would be no way to get back to it, which is really scary. And if you didn't name it, there really is no way to get back to it. it there's, that's, you have to name it. That's the save action in Lightworks. So hopefully that's clear. Um, okay, so let's... You know, honestly, most video editors actually are. They're just doing what are called EDLs, edit decision lists. They don't need to, they don't really care what your picture looks like. All they want to know is what time code you're at, or I don't know, it probably gets into lower levels of, of in the codec stuff, like page t flips or something. But yeah, they don't care about the, all, everything that we see. They, they edit by the numbers. So, um, so I'm, I'll take another clip here randomly. And again, it's just I to mark your, the, the point where it's good, and then O to mark the point where it stops being good. And then again, the buttons that you care about are down here at the bottom. The two that you need to know right now are either replace or insert. So, I mean, if for some reason, I don't know, if we're doing an experimental film or something, because it wouldn't really make any sense to do this, but let's just say we, we want to do this for some reason. If we want to intercut this guy walking into the church during the fight scene for some reason, we could position our little playhead here in our, in our edit window to wherever we want that to happen, and then do an insert edit, and sure enough, it drops right into place. It drops this walking scene right in the middle of the, of the fight scene. So that's obviously, I mean, you could probably kind of have guessed that that was gonna do because it's called insert edit. Um, and obviously if we did a replace edit, it would not do that. It would just write over, write over all the footage. You, there would be no lengthening of your entire project. You're writing over clips. Um, so insert and replace are kind of self-explanatory, I think. Um, okay, so at some point in your edit, actually I'm going to back out of this project and open, I think I have another test project that has a little bit more sense to it. Oh, maybe I don't. Okay, I guess I'll just keep using my really bad example. Um, we'll just pretend like all of this makes sense, these random cuts. Um, at some point during your edit, I mean, the workflow here would be that you would, you would continue to look at all of your clips, and I'm gonna look at them as a list instead of big thumbnails just to make it a little bit easier to fit onto this screen. But you would look through all of your clips, you would find the good ones that kind of make sense in relation to one another and you would drop them into your edit sequence. That's how you edit video. That's how you tell stories that make some semblance of sense. Um, at some point, you would have a story that, that is the story that you wanted to tell when you were making this, this video, whether it's in a home movie or whether it's a, a, a short film that you're working on, whatever. Uh, but it tends to be pretty rough. There tends to be edits that don't quite match uh, and things like that. So you need to kind of, like even there, like let's just say for whatever reason we wanted this guy to 
we didn't want so much blank empty screen before he comes onto the screen, into frame, right? Maybe we want to cut more like, more like right here where he's sort of already in, to, in the frame. So at that point, you kind of want to start working down in your edit, in your edit window. Uh, this is usually what people who are used to like the more drag and droppy kind of editing, uh, like Final Cut and stuff like that are used to. Uh, they, they like to mess around in their timeline or their edit window a lot more than usually they probably should, but it, it, it's a way of working, and, and Lightworks lets you do that as well. So you might not really be able to see it completely, but as I roll my mouse over the edge of these clips, you can kind of see that the icon is changing very subtly. So over on the left side of this splice line, where one clip ends and one clip begins, the, uh, there's a little bracket under the arrow that's sort of open on the left side. If I, swap, if I cross over, the bracket switches so that it's open on the right side. And then if I hover over the splice line itself, the brackets are kind of against each other. So all this is telling you is that if you click right now so that your mouse is on the, on the left side of your rightmost clip, then you can grab where that clip starts and pull it over uh, in whatever direction you want to. So I've just clicked, and it kind of lifts this clip out of the edit temporarily. And now I can move. I can move. Let me try that again. I should be able to move this clip. That's totally not working. There it goes. OK. We were just. OK, that's really weird. I think I'm clicking at the wrong place. Hold on. OK. I think I was doing it right. OK. So if I click on this clip, I should be able to move it over until this guy enters the frame a little bit more. except that it's not really working for me. Try one more time. OK, here we go. You see how this is now moving? Uh, this isn't actually what I wanted to do either, though. This is actually this is lengthening the leftmost video clip and shortening the rightmost video clip. And you can kind of see where one is going to end now and where one is going to begin. So it's lengthening there on the left. It's drawing out that fight scene. And it's shortening this clip over here on the right. So that's where I want him to enter, right there. So I would drop it and click outside of it. And now it replaces all of the footage back into the edit. And now I have. Jeez. You're supposed to click <laughs> there. OK. Now it's replaced all the footage back into the edit. And my goodness. And he comes in when I wanted him to come in. Uh, I'm not really sure why it's not doing what I want it to do, though, in terms of I didn't really want to lengthen this clip. But in theory, I should be able to click on this clip now and shorten it back the other way. That's doing it. And so now I've got a much shorter movie, right? So now I've got a quick cut of, this, of these people, uh, of, of this guy coming in. No, I'm still not out. OK. I've got a quick clip of him coming in. 
and then him entering more or less where I said I wanted him to be entering, and then we cut back inexplicably to the fight scene. Um, so I don't know. I mean, th there's, there's a little gray strip, uh, strip up here that you're supposed to be able to click on to sort of, un to sort of get out of this sort of this, this move action where you can move the clips around. And I'm either not seeing the strip with, from the contrast of this screen or this version of Lightworks is not doing that very well. It's been kind of an off and on, off and on again kind of problem with Lightworks lately. So I don't know if that's just me missing my mark or if it's this version, the latest version of, of this copy of Lightworks, which I think is 111H or something like that. Um, either way, the principle is that you click on a, one side of the, the clip and you can either shorten it or, or make it longer, whatever you need to do to make your edit a little bit more smooth. Um, let's see. Oh, and it's still in that raised view. Okay. Um, okay, so. Well, any questions on that so far? I mean, I think it's pretty basic stuff. I mean, you select your clips, you dump it into your edit window, and, and that's how you edit video. Um, yeah, so any questions about that? Okay. The which one? Oh, it's actually just uh, like tips. Like if I click on him, he should. The red shark is not working right now. Um, usually, if you click on that, it, it brings up like a, a tip on on like whatever it's supposed to be contextual to what it's the paper clip. Um, but it's not working right now. Okay, so um, yeah, and this is, this is I think 111.h. So I don't know, maybe give it two weeks before you try it and see if they, if they, because this, the, you, I don't know if you can, you guys can probably see it on the screen. You can kind of see how it lifts out like that, right? Oh, maybe they changed it actually, because now it's doing it when I click on the clips themselves. It used to be you had to click on the gray area to sort of reseat everything. Um, so that might be something that they're changing or something. I'm not sure. Okay, so um, we've, we've got a basic edit here. Let me just go, what, what time is it? Like what? 15 more minutes? All right. So really quickly, hopefully, um, let me try to show you a little bit of the effect interface just so you can kind of see that, that there, are, um, there are ways to change what you're looking at. So I've just imported another clip, and I'm going to drag it into my reel that I, or my uh, bin that I want to keep. Okay, so here's a clip. And let's just say, let's say I want some of the close-up stuff, more or less. So I'm hitting in and out, I and O for, for my marks. And then I'm just going to randomly, uh, I'll do a replace edit. And now it's in my edit. It's in my movie. So this is the, the new clip that I've just, that I've just dropped into my, uh, into my movie. So let's say that um, it's looking good, but I want to make it look better. Um, hopefully this is still there. Uh, so if I click the effects button, which is in the lower right-hand corner of my, of my edit window, of my little timeline here, if I hit the effects window while my playhead is positioned over a clip, then that brings up, and usually, just so you know, usually all these windows, how they're popping up on screen, sort of like off the screen, that's, that's never happened before. It's just a byproduct, I think, of the projector. Um, it's, that's never happened on a, a monitor before, so it's, it's not as rough around th that edge as, as it looks. Um, so in here are a bunch of different kinds of effects. Um, I always favor color correction because I, I love color correction. Um, but there are other ones. There are fades and blurs and masks and green screens. And I mean, just everything that a good video editor ought to provide. They're, they're here already. I'm sure there will probably be more later. 
But like right now, it's a really, really full set of, of effects. Split screens, um, quadruple split, split screens, flips, flops, just all kinds of stuff. So it's, I mean, it's, even though there are little things here and there that don't seem to be exactly polished yet, it, it's, it's a very mature kind of, of a feeling uh, project uh, in, in every other way. So I'm gonna just double click on, on color correction and you might be able to see right here in the upper, upper region of the, uh, of the video file, there's a little tiny square there now, like right up there in the, the corner. Um, that means that there's an effect on that, on that track. So, and it also helps that it popped up a really huge effect window here. Um, so, I mean, if you've ever used a video editor, this is really, really familiar. So you, you've positioned your playhead on a clip, you've put an effect on the clip, the effect is there, it doesn't look like anything right now because it hasn't changed. It's at, it, everything's set to like the defaults, null values or whatever. So it's not really that big of a deal. But, um, but you can obviously change stuff and, and typically the stuff that you, ugh, typically the stuff that you want to change I have no idea what just happened. Well, that was weird. Uh, typically what you wanna change, and I'm gonna be very careful this time not to click something that will break it, um, are things like like the oranges, the ambers, uh, because that's where the human skin tone is. So like if you've got mid-tones, that would, that would be the human skin. So you'd just add a little bit of, of, that's never happened before. So like I say, it's in beta. Um, normally what would happen here is that you would click on the color wheel and it would not blank everything out and you would be able to add things to, um, you would be able to add filters and things like that to, to, your, to your clip. And it, it, it feels like it's not picking up my, my clicks or something. I'm not really sure why it's doing that, but that's really weird. Um, hmm. Yeah, okay. So there's that, that this is not working today. But it's been working like every other day that I've used it. Um, it's never really blanked it out like that. That's, Really, really weird. Let's see. Let's try it one more time. Why not? Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing the uh, the. Um, I don't really want to do that, but okay. Let's just try it one more time, just for kicks. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so the effect isn't working today. Sorry. Um, I would maybe maybe wait on uh, on downloading this particular version of Lightworks. Sorry. Um, okay, so that's that's the idea of effects. Um, Wherever your playhead is, that's where your focus is essentially, and anything that you do to a clip in that case will will be done, you know, to whatever your playhead is is uh, is focused over. So that's just kind of that's how that works. Um, the the last thing that I probably could get to today right now is just the simplest one is exporting. So after you've cut your, you know, you've spliced all your video clips together. Maybe you've affected them, maybe not. Depends on how beta you are in your Lightworks instance. Uh, and then you would click the export button, which is near the bottom of this toolbar. Again, logically, I mean, as you can kind of tell, it, it's kind of giving you choices in the way that they kind of make sense. And there's a lot of other good things to know about, and I'll try to get to it in a minute if we have time. But for now, exporting is, is exporting. There aren't that many choices, which as someone who really loves to compress video for fun, um, this is kind of painful to see. But right, I, I'm assuming again that this is all going to change for the better when the, the source code is released. Uh, right now, you've got your choice of, of 
of different formats. There's not a huge variety. You can do an image sequence if you're going to export it out to like Blender or something for, for compositing. You can do MOVs, MXFs if you're going out to like Avid or something. Uh, Wave files, um, which seems like it should be up with AAF, but I guess not. Um, AVCHD, you know, all, the, all these sort of formats that I don't really love any of them, but there they are. Um, do your, the, the size, typically you don't want to change your size. Usually you want to keep it as close to your original as possible. Um, so I'm just going to put it as HD 720 because that's 720p. I haven't changed my frame rate, obviously. So essentially I'm just, I'm, I'm just putting, I'm, I'm outputting pretty much exactly what I brought in. MOVs at 24 frames per second at 720p. Um, and you can tell it where to save the, the, um, the file. I'll be okay with this for now. And then you can give it a file name, or it can give it itself. Uh, it can just name itself um, 2013 demo. And then start. And it shouldn't take long. Um, yeah, as you can see, there's not really any compression going on. So it's just kind of it's sending everything that is already in the timeline out to its own dedicated file, and then some, apparently. And that's probably my fault because I probably extended a clip and then and then retracted it. I don't know why it's still spinning. It, it says it's complete. Um, Quite possibly the export function uh, could be not working right now either. OK, so that's Lightworks. It's beta. It's a beta project. Um, feel free to download it and test it out. Give the edit share guys feedback. Um, tell them about problems as you come across them. I have, and it has been, it, it's been it's felt very open source. Like it's been very good responses. It's been like, hey, this is happening on my computer. Here's what I'm running. And then like in two days, they'll have a new beta release out that fixes your problem. So they've been really, really responsive. Um, overall, I get a pretty good feeling from, from the project. I, would, I, would, I think I would feel a lot more secure if there was source code out there that that way, I would just know that it's there. But right now, it's it's being developed uh, a lot. It's they're working really hard on it. So uh, if you're interested, beta test it. It's an open beta right now. Just go download it, use it, and report errors, and they will um, they will fix them. Any questions? Uh, if I can get this thing to respond. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it seems very, very much of, of the time right now. Like, I haven't, I mean, we, we use fairly modern cameras at, at, at the school where I work, and I've just imported stuff. It's been a no-brainer. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it actually, that, that's not true. It hasn't been a no-brainer. It's, it's, well, it has been a no-brainer as long as I'm importing files from those cameras. If it's files from elsewhere, then, then sometimes it does screw me over because there's not a whole lot of support. It's like it's almost got to be like a modern camera, or, or maybe you know a three-year-old camera. Like that's that's kind of the window of opportunity. If it's even SD Mini DV, I don't even know. Like I haven't I haven't actually tested it, but I'm not sure. Like it, it it's it's pretty limited in its support right now. But I'm again I'm assuming that that's going to change. So. Any other questions? Well, not not directly because that's not really how it's done usually. Like I mean, yes and no. Like, what, what I would do is, like, if I was working on something in Lightworks, 
that required compositing, um, typically you just take you just take the clip that you need, which I would show you, you, but as long as your playhead is over a clip, then you can just export that one clip. You would mark that clip as an in and out in your edit, um, just like you do for a viewer with the I and the O button. I really wish I could show you that right now. Um, I have a feeling, well, anyway, you would mark it in and out, and you could even do it with these buttons, and you would, you would export that clip as an image sequence because that's what Blender really wants to see anyway. It doesn't like video, it likes images. So I would export it like as full quality either Targa or TIFF files and then import that whole folder into Blender, do your compositing, export it back out into Lightwork or back out to your hard drive and then import those composited files back into Lightworks. That's actually with the one notable exception of like Afterworks, uh, uh, After Effects and Premiere like every other, like the every other application I've ever heard of does it that way. It, it it doesn't do an internal round tripping like After Effects and Premiere does. You export it as an image sequence. You either hand it to your your compositor or you drive over to the compositing house. You know, two blocks away. You give it to them. They do their magic and they give you the files back. So that's that's normal. Um, I, I haven't really done it because I'm not a compositor, but I mean. I don't see why it wouldn't work, other than the fact that I'm at a spinning wheel right now <laughs> from just having exported. But I mean, like once it's all smoothed out, it, it ought to be pretty transparent. Any other questions? What is the red shark that we're not supposed to click because it's hungry? Oh, it just gives you like tips uh, on how to use it. It like says, you know, like, did you know that if you, yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, I don't know if there was like a historical reason for that. I don't know where the red shark came from, but it's there. Um, and it's not working anyway. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks for attending. Enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and 
of the uh, you know of the community and and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community it is global and it's definitely because of the users community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help if you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. 
The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.